Hello and good evening, everyone. At Fridays for Future in India, this is the first day of our People for the Planet campaign. With this campaign, we want to amplify the voices of the indigenous community, which has been the first steward of environmental protection in India, and their voices have been silent and they have been unheard for a long time now. Today, our guest speaker is Yuvan. Yuvan is a naturalist, a writer, an activist. He's based in Chennai. He's been part of many social movements. And he's also spent a lot of time devising the curricula for nature education in a lot of schools. He's the recipient of N. Krishnan Memorial Natural Writing Award. And his book, A Naturalist Journal, is a collection of essays on country, uh, countryside wilderness. I would now like Yuvan to take over from here and inform us all about what this is. Hey, thank you, Arushi, uh, for the introduction. And thank you, Fridays for Future, for giving this opportunity to speak on this platform. Let me just share my screen one second. Just let me know if, if my screen is um, visible. It is, yes, please. Okay, and are the slides changing? Not sure. Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, today what I'll be attempting to do is to trace the way water flows in uh, communities, in people of this region of South India, a, a diverse uh, landscape, both culturally, uh, geographically, ecologically. So it's a very vast task. So I'm gonna try to do, do it very broadly and try to evoke some of the relationships people share and have with um, how water permeates this region. And I'm going to try to recourse back then to something we are fighting for uh, right now. And that is what you see here in this picture. It's Vedandangal, some, uh, a water body under threat and a water body which is protected by the local community. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do that and uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, one sec. So just a little bit about um, this region and how uh, its geography and, and its weather. So on the Western side is the Western Ghats mountains and on the Eastern side is the Coromandel coast, largely plains. And during June, July, the Western coast receive, it receives its monsoon and the Western Ghats mountains run right from the tip of Kerala right up to Goa and beyond. And the Western side of the mountains get a lot of rainfall while the side of the mountains blocking the leeward side, uh, parts of it are arid and it's a rainforest. Coming to the Eastern coast, Eastern coast, coast uh, touches is adjacent to the Bay of Bengal. The Bay of Bengal is a very interesting water body uh, in the world. Uh, two water bodies are spoken of to be the most moody, the most unpredictable in the way they keep spewing out storms, cyclones, tidal surges. One is the Caribbean Sea, other is the Bay of Bengal. So this entire place is very prone to cyclones, is prone to uh, flooding, uh, unpredictable rains and so on. And this side, not uh, too mountainous, though there are, is a discontiguous patch of the Eastern Ghats, is largely uh, flat land, grassland, scrub, plains, and so on. So that is uh, the peninsular part of India. Um, coming to how uh, uh, people live here, you know, there's an interesting uh, uh, quote from uh, Adivasi quote, and uh, it's about their self-reliance. And they say, uh, Jal jungle jameen, and that is all we need to be able to sustain ourselves. So, water, forest, and land was their ecology of self reliance. Um, if you see historically, if you have water, if you have uh, land to cultivate, you really don't need to uh, depend on anything else outside. And this is an important thing historically because. Often, if you look at wars, if you look at other kinds of 
feudal battles between kingdoms the first strategic uh, thing to uh, attack the other kingdom would be uh, to break its water body to poison its water source and that way the the community is destabilized so so water uh, i'll be speaking about in that context as a central thing for self reliance and how we have been in the present paradigm of development moving away from that and then feeling its backlash yeah so i i will come back to the other two points later during the presentation So, one of the interesting things uh, within communities living here, farmers, Adivasis, whether it be the Mulakurma tribes or the or the agricultural communities of Kanchipuram, uh, the Shiliga tribe in Kerala, um, if you read their literature, if you listen to them speak, land, water, tree, these are all not inert medium, uh, not resources which are lying without. uh without life but they are active players in their life and their uh, relationship with this uh with these media is is a reciprocal one land is an active part in their culture just as the way something something animal something creaturely would be and that's that's very interesting to note and these were all uh community owned so the concept of commons if you listen to some people um for instance a p sainath or other kinds of activists who uh, give voice to these communities you will so i find them saying that to own land to privately occupy it seems absurd uh, just as the way you own something which is living and has its own autonomy it it it's an animate thing and this cultural soil is where a lot of water conservation systems as well as other kinds of conservation values uh, evolved that something like forest something like wetland something like a grassland cannot be owned it has a life uh, and vitality of itself and we go and enter it and it enters us and it, it, these are the in these uh, shared spaces uh, of 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 culture is where a lot of these um conservation systems grew and that's something very important to note and we'll keep coming back to that so and part of the commons was also uh, sacrality uh, many of these water bodies were either attached to a temple and they were part of a deity or the water body by itself was sacred in its own right huh. i'm going to kind of describe a few um water conservation systems uh to kind of evoke the broad principles by which they evolved and how they work yeah now uh, this is panam kene in uh, in kerala and about uh, five six tribes use this and they are supposed to be the inventors of it especially in the region of vayanad um now how it is built is that it is it uses the bottom portion of the sago palm trunk so they take it out of the soil and they allow it to rot and when that happens the quality of the trunk changes and it's an extraordinary imbiber of water it becomes like a huge capillary uh, tube and what they do is they build a little well where they think there is ground water and then they line the well in at the bottom and on the walls with the sago palm and then what happens is the palm kind of sucks ground water out and gives it out it's like it's like a a rotten tree trunk spring and that is the panam keni in kerala panam is palm and keni uh, translates to well in various languages indian languages uh, a slightly more distant example are the melkote ponds in um, mandya district interesting thing about this place is that it does not have a single perennial water source no natural lakes no rivers it's completely rain fed and having said that it also never faces a shortage of water because the it has a very uh, a complex interlink system of ponds which is adapted to catch rain water from mountain slopes it's a hill town and it's a very rugged landscape 
So it it uh, kind of traps rainwater, and then there are filter ponds, uh, canals which lead it to various ponds at at different gradients. These are a few other among perhaps hundreds within India. There are villages which have their own uh, systems of water conservation, towns, communities. It could be that uh, a water conservation system is unique because of its design, its structure, because of how it's adapted to that specific habitat, or it could be in the way uh, it is governed or, or distributed. So these are a few more. Of course, we could put up resources where you could uh, read more about them, but these are just some which can fit into a slide. Yeah. Um, now, one interesting aspect of uh, traditional water conservation is that uh, the vegetation and the hydrology of place share a very deep mutual relationship. And people have learned to read this. You know, uh, nowadays we have, you know, geospatial techniques, we drill, we, you know, do seismic tests to find out how water flows under the soil. If you take a water body or, or a wa water's body, it sprawls far vaster underneath the ground than above it. And it's very interesting how people read without actually seeing beneath the ground how this, how this was. So this is the field of ethnogeobotany. Now, just to give you a few examples, if you've been uh, to a lake in Tamil Nadu or, or in Andhra or Telangana, we will look at some examples. You see that they're lined with palmyra palms, palm trees. A palmyra palm is something called a phreatophyte. What a phreatophyte is that it puts its root, you cannot water it. After a point, it, its root goes right into the groundwater. And what phreatophytes do over a period of years, decades, is that they go and break the bedrock underneath the soil, beneath the subsoil. So it becomes more porous, it has more cracks. So when it rains, there's space within under the soil for it to hold water. They make, they are aquifer makers, as it were. Those are palmyra palms. Sago palms, of course, their trunk has this strange quality of imbibing water. There is, um, a practice in the Karavali region of Karnataka, they do something called water drenching, where they make these ropes and systems with the sago palm uh, trunk material so that the, in the canals, water is constantly flowing and the fields are constantly wet. Some of these trees, white damma, white fig, vatakani, uh, chandada, these are local names for the makaranga tree. They are uh, geobotanical indicators. So if they grow in a place and if they're growing well, it's very clear that there's groundwater there. So you can dig your well there, or you can you know, make some of these water systems which will, can, can draw the water out for them. Um, there are many more trees. For instance, these are white fig and makaranga are in the Western Ghats. In, in, in the Eastern Plains, there are other trees which indicate uh, several ficus trees. The bat fig, for instance, uh, is a very strong phreatophyte. It, if it grows really well in a place, then in, uh, locals know hey, there's groundwater there. Barringtonia will come to later in the context of Bedandangal. Mangrove species, especially to coastal communities whose water is constantly threatened by seawater intrusion, mangroves hold soil and buffer the battering of waves. And several other kinds of mangrove species, um, what they do, for instance, uh, rhizophora, um, Avicennia. What they do is, especially in inland water bodies, which are prone to uh, salt intrusion, they clean it, they, they extract the salt out of it and make clean water. And there's, these are you know, seen as miraculous plants in, in various uh, traditions, uh, uh, dozens of mangrove species. Now, I'm, I'm cautious to not paint a very uh, romantic picture when it comes to local um, traditions or, or the prevailing cultures in India. And uh, I want to talk about this example, the, the water system called the Thale or the Talava in, in Maharashtra is a linked pond system for irrigation and domestic use. 
but uh, it is a system which is used only by the so-called upper caste and um, the 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 lower caste people or the or who uh, the dalits and the so-called untouchables who who are labeled that at that time and even now uh, they had water bodies outside the town and and mismanaged ones dirtier ones and the chavdar tale which was a specific pond in uh, mahad in maharashtra uh, has a very important role in the in our socio political history so in 1927 um Ma ambedkar uh, was protesting campaigning against this uh, extraordinary social in injustice of some humans uh, considers uh, considered more supreme more dominant and others considered lowly so he said uh, we are all equal and he led a satyagraha of thousands of uh, so called low caste peoples to this uh, lake and he said let's drink from that lake and it was a lake given only for the upper caste hindus and then when that happened some of the upper caste hindus incited a, a very violent attack on the on these people and um, that's marked in uh, history thousands of them were, were brutally uh, injured and uh, the salt satyagraha which gandhi led was um, was a protest against external colonialism while this satyagraha not very well known but it perhaps as important was against an internal uh, hegemony internal colonialism as it were and it is marked in our history because um march 28 uh, the day this satyagraha happened is now considered a social empowerment day as perhaps some of you may know so how did uh, the these these water systems change with changing times what happened to these cultures they are existent now uh, here and there and some of them are still alive but uh, they've been uh, deeply affected and where water systems are affected all human beings are affected so when when uh, when india was colonized one of the things which happened is that the people's relationship with land changed with nature changed nature was an active player it was an animate thing which uh, kind of had a cyclical effect within their life you know but the the culture which the british brought in was that which portrayed natural resources resources which was a new word um as commodity as as a resource and so that kind of changed the way people imagine water imagine land trees and so on of course the industrialization and uh, other things um destroyed a lot of these water bodies other kind of uh, colonialization which happened is that sometimes destruction of water bodies was important to kind of dismantle the self reliance communities had within themselves because they had water you know there's this very interesting quote by uh, h jordan who said the thousands have lived without love but none without water so um that was something they were they were doing and this whole thing of extracting something and the consequences of it being far removed you now the people who who um, caused that were least affected by it and so on but the same even after independence what has happened is that the same paradigm of of progress and development and industrialization has increased manifold it um one thing about the british is that uh they they did an extraordinary documentation of a hydrologies of a geography flora fauna and so on and some of uh these water systems were in fact documented by them and that's how they were pa passed on to many of us studying this but the present paradigm of development um is firstly ignorant of what water is and what these cultures were and it just uh, marches on and the destruction it has caused is exponentially more than what we faced in colonial uh, times these are just a few cities i took from so bangalore has lost 80% of its wetland between 73 and 2016 this is from a paper by indian institute of science chennai 62% mumbai 71% um 
those are just a few examples of course if there are people from other cities do go and find out um what this means uh, within your your city and what uh, how much of your wetlands were lost the other thing i want to add here is that um uh, what shekhar raghavan he's a he's a reviver of water conservation systems in chennai and he's written a very interesting book called chennai the land of concrete coffins uh, and that describes concrete very well you know concrete is an uh, unimaginative substance and one of the most dangerous things it does is that it breaks the bond between sky and soil and water cannot seep into the ground so what happens there's there's a huge biology living under the subsoil which is hibernating and each time water touches soaks the soil the land exhales that you know right from uh, pupating insects cicadas frogs uh, snakes grasshoppers all kinds of life and cement what it does is just seals them in and then it it parches the mouths of aquif aquifers groundwater resources lying underneath so so they are made dry and places like chennai the entire uh, eastern coast in 2015 we faced a flood and it was termed an urban planning disaster because the water fell it can't go into the soil it had nowhere to go so we were under water and this um, I, i recall one quote by uh, environmentalist nityanand jairam he says there's only one way to harvest rainwater there's only one real way to harvest rainwater which is to leave earth open to sky so So I want to recourse from there back to uh, closer to where uh, I live, and um, that is to Tamil Nadu. And before I do that, uh, I just want to say that water and other kinds of ecologies in the cultural imagination of of people of the entire Indian region is very vivid, and its vocabulary for it is astonishing. And there are hundreds of words for water water bodies land soil grassland and so on i've just put a collection of words here which cannot be spoken in english they don't have a, a corollary in the english language and what happens is that when these water body words go water bodies go then uh it it is a kind of a a a, a, a linguistic death uh, so to speak Uh, for instance uh, let me just tell you the meanings of you see this word arli kinar uh, it means it's a spring fresh water spring which occurs very close to salt water near the sea as a kind of a, uh, you know a geographical rarity geological rarity um uh, sengai is a lake which is defined by the quality of water allows for duckweed and water cabbage to flourish in it it's defined by these two plants senga is that there's no word for like that in english if you take poigai it is a water body which is defined by lilies lotuses and therefore the general aesthetic beauty of of that place uh yeri sunai is, is is a naturally occurring spring pool up in the mountains um let's uh, delve a little bit deeper into this word airy which uh, kind of defines the entire um, landscape of tamil nadu andhra and this whole southern uh, southeastern stretch of of india so airy again does not have a equivalent in english in english if you if you read papers if you read articles about airy they call it tanks they call it reservoirs that's not really the meaning an airy is a man made lake and it has three sides of embankment where water is allowed to collect and on one side on one direction there is a catchment so catchment is where water is allowed to flow in and the catchment is grassland so the airy system values grasslands a lot because grasslands are far more important for water than water bodies than forests grass hold soil together far better than trees so uh, what would happen if there was no grass for instance that when water flowed it would bring soil silt and cover up the water body grass holds it together and uh, so the oldest um, 
record of the science of water bodies. How do you build it? What do you take into account for creating one? Is uh, dates back to 1291 in Kadapa in, a, in an inscription next to the Pomerilla area. Yeah. And the way an area is built is it's a cascading water system. So it's linked to various other uh, water bodies, which are also areas through canals, channels, uh, smaller water bodies. And so one area fills, and once it fills, it gives it to the next area. And then they kind of branch out, branch out. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tree of water bodies, you know, so, so to speak, or, or, or a branching root of water bodies. Um, it's just... Um, and Yeris were uh, the cultural creation of farmers of this region. They were irrigation tanks, but they also created extraordinary ecologies. What you see here again is the Vedandangal bird sanctuary. And one of the things uh, Vedandangal, uh, the people of Vedandangal did was they planted Barringtonia trees inside the water body. Now just let's look at its own story. Perhaps in the history of water bodies, Vedandangal across India, Vedandangal holds a very special place because it's, it, um, it is a place where uh, there's a very strange kinship and it is between the bird and the farmer. So century, it's a centuries old lake. It's about 70 hectares. And what farmers here found out is that when birds nest and their uh, guano, their poop falls in the water, it, it creates a bloom of phytoplankton and, and other kinds of nitrogenous phosphoric nutrients. And when that is used for irrigation, the, the yield of paddy is extraordinary. So uh, what they did was they protected this place for centuries. Hunting is not allowed here. Um, things like Diwali and other noisy kind of festivals, traditionally people don't celebrate here. So over centuries of trust, uh, let, let me just go back to this picture. Birds come here in tens of thousands and they breed and the local community protects it. Um, this is the entrance to Verandanga. And these are just a few birds uh, um, there. And the other uh, part of the relationship between birds and uh, farmers here is that a lot of water birds are uh, agricultural friends. For instance, you see this bird on the right is the open bill stock. In Tamil, it's called the Nattai Kutti Nare which means uh, snail eating stock. The open bill stock, if you look at its bill, actually, it's not open, it's, it's shaped like that. It is adapted to wedge open the apple snail and eat the snail. Apple snails are pests of paddy roots. And similarly, if you take uh, shanks, um, still sandpipers, they eat crabs and other kinds of agricultural uh, pests. I mean, we call them pests, but they have their role in their ecosystem. Um, so they were, that was another way in which uh, farmers and birds kind of shared a, a, a mutual relationship. And this kind of um, man-animal relationship you see in very few places across India, perhaps in Dibang Valley, Arunachal Pradesh, the tiger and the mishmi share a strange relationship. Uh, in, in Rajasthan, the Bishnoi the tribals and the black buck, and Vedandangal, the water birds and the farmers. Um, so that's a spotted outlet. And um, one thing you witness as soon as you walk into Vedandangal is that birds trust for people. You know, elsewhere, if you were perhaps a long distance away, a flock of birds would fly off. But here, you'd be right there and they'll be nesting, completely trusting people's presence. And this is a spotted outlet, which... Uh, you know, I, I was there with my camera and this outlet was there looking at me as curiously, you know, like, you know, right into me. And these are painted stalks and uh, black headed ibis. Another special thing about Vedandangal is that unlike other protected areas, this was a community protected area. So over various periods of time, people protected it as a, as a, as a community practice. And then they found that the British had this a uh, practice of hunting for game, you know, as, as a kind of a hobby to go out and hunt animals. So in 1890s, they got the first uh, cowl, a paper signed by the then uh, district uh, collector, uh, Englishman called El Place, uh, saying that hunting will not be allowed here and they have rights to protect the birds. And then later it was made, they got it protection of a reserve forest. And then later in the 1990s, 
1998, it was declared a sanctuary, a bird sanctuary. So, um, Vedangangal is as much a nursery for children as it is for birds. And th these are just a couple of photos where I've taken children there. And when it is in season, hundreds of schools come there to learn about the lake ecosystem, to watch the birds, um, to understand this, this community conservation which is going on there. And just adjacent to Vedangangal, you see a huge expanse of paddy fields. And then water from the lake being carried out into these fields and then birds in the lake, birds uh, foraging in the fields. So Vedandangal, the central lake, as well as five kilometer area around the lake was declared as a bird sanctuary. And that's a very important thing to note. Uh, we'll, we'll just come back to that. <clears throat> this is the map of Kanchipuram. And despite all the destruction to water bodies and uh, the Yeri systems, these are the number of Yeris which exist here, about 2,000 in number. And these are just the Yeris, not the smaller ponds, the, the, the tanks, the, the canals, the paddy fields, you know, these are just the Yeris and this is a map from 2013. And um, people understood here that this was the only way to live on this land, to create space for water, to make way for it to flow. If you had a way of kind of denying that right of passage to water, then it would submerge you. Uh, and that is something we are experiencing. Uh, you know, um, in Chennai, in Kanchipuram, in, across these regions, we face a very, uh, you know, a strange paradox of floods during the monsoon and then drought during the, you know, the, the summer. What these Yeris did was, you know, very rarely are humans uh, a beneficial biological or geological force. And by making this, this you know, complex water body system, what they did was they made sure that this land had water throughout the year. Because southern India, uh, unlike the northern plains of India, does not have glacial rivers. Most of it are seasonal rivers which flow three, four months a year. And even the perennial rivers like Kaveri, Mahanadi, uh, they, they flow rap, you know, uh, dr drastically fluctuates uh, with season. So this water body system was essential to be able to live on this land. Now, uh, I've put this slide here uh, just to kind of evoke a contrast. Now, this is often how land exists in our imagination. We use Google Maps very often, other kinds of you know, GPS and then uh, you know, maps which have our routes and roads. Now, what does a map of a land actually look like, which is alive? This is the map of Vedandangal, and you can see Vedandangal here. And then this is about, uh, uh, you know, five kilometers or more around it. I'm going to switch. This is how the same thing looks. This is the cardiovascular system of the land, the hydrological arteries. And this is what really uh, breathes life into it. And this is rarely in our imagination. Do, do we see land like this? We see roads and tarmac, asphalt and concrete. But this is what sustains life. And, um, and the people here have a deep knowledge of this. And to construct areas, they have to take into account which side a river lies. What is the gradient of the land? What is the subsoil hydrology like? And all this kind of knowledge have existed since ancient times and that was required to create this water body system. So um, right here is Vedandangal and around it is uh, our various other water bodies. Now this is the sanctuary, Vedandangal sanctuary. Right in the middle you see uh, Vedandangal and then the circle is the five kilometer radius around it. Now, one important thing, uh, thing we have to understand about wetlands is that they are social beings. You know, you could call them social entities. They can't exist alone. They need their drainage system, how water flows in. They need their sibling water bodies for them to be able to uh, either uh, transfer their water or receive water so that the embankments are healthy. They need their catchment area. They need their scrublands, grasslands, so that uh, they are not silted and soil is too much soil is not brought into them and they don't suffocate. 
So they need this whole family of ecosystems to be able to survive. And this is what you see here in um, uh, around Vedandanga. So here is Vedandanga. And here is a large water body called the Madurandakam tank. And all around here, thousands of acres of paddy fields are sustained by them. And birds nest in Vedandanga tank, but they roost in large numbers. They fly to collect nest material. They uh, go around to forage. They use the entire five kilometers and beyond. And this is a little GPS study we did. Um, and let me explain that to you. Um, what you see here is the five kilometer radius. And I'll tell you how Vedandangal works, a little, the wisdom behind creating it. Now in this uh, upper left corner, you see a little river channel flowing. That is called the Cheyar River. And this entire region is in, and in this uh, river channel is called the Palar River. So in this, this region in between is in the basins of the Cheyar and the Palar River. And whenever they flood, the area is received. So here is the Uttarameru tank, which receives water. And then Vedandangal here receives water from two channels. So one, from the Cheyar River, it comes here and then flows into various wetlands and, and then it receives water. Another is a, a part of the Cheyar River you don't see in the map and it reaches the Isur wetlands and, and other areas and then it flows back in. So, you know, it, you, we kind of understand then why the drainage pattern is important. So right now the threat to Vedandangal uh, bird sanctuary is that is twofold. One is there are players here uh, the blue dots you see here on, on this part. They are illegal industries sitting inside Verandanga and they are polluting the water bodies. Um, and inside a wildlife sanctuary, you can't have a red category industry. These are mostly pharmaceutical industries, battery companies and so on. And people have been protesting against their presence for decades. And the other threat is that the government during uh, close to the pandemic, it proposed that it's going to denotify, as in shrink the Vedandangal uh, sanctuary space by about 60% by reducing the outer two kilometers and make it, you know, about a yeah, small. Now, what that would do is that if this, for commercial purposes, so what that would do very interestingly is that if it was shrunk by two kilometers, all these illegal players sitting here would come outside and they would be legalized. And the other thing is, this northwestern region of the Vedandangal Sanctuary is very important for it to receive water and give it to the lake, which the birds use. You know, birds here, uh, on an on average season, 40,000 breeding birds come here to breed, you know, from various parts. And on a good year, up to 70,000 birds come. And when they have their chicks breed, uh, fledge and go, the birds are lax in number. Now, if this whole uh, place was industrialized, the drainage pattern would be blocked. All these, uh, the system would be disturbed and then water would stop coming in. In the imagination of the government, the, the only, they are saying only the lake is important for the birds. That's not true. That lake is as a social being. It needs all of this to be able to survive. And the birds also use the entire five kilometer radius. Now, coming back to um, the illegal industries, uh, specifically uh, Sun Pharma, uh, which actually proposed uh, expansion proposal while they're sitting inside. They're illegally sitting inside and then they propose to expand. And all of us uh, started campaigning against it, various groups and the farmers there, the panchayat leaders there and so on. They, it, it, it's an entire agrarian landscape inside Vedandangal and its whereabouts. This is uh, Ramesh's fields. He is a farmer in Vedandangal, and here you see his father-in-law. And what he, uh, he and various other farmers have been complaining is that these industries have been illegally polluting the water bodies they've been using, uh, which the farmers use to irrigate their fields and for, for domestic uses, drinking and so on. And the bird numbers have gone down, bird deaths are occurring. And here we went to his well here and then we smelled the water. And then it, it, it smelled like a chemical lab. And that was the first time it was an experience for me. We took soil from his fields and water from his well and it, it smelled like a chemical lab, like, 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 a, uh, like a draw of tablets 
you know um and uh, he and uh, a lot of others are complaining of skin diseases acute agricultural crop failure he showed us uh, a mango orchard which is completely dying because of the kind of effluence coming from the, the companies which are their industries so our, our campaigns are taking various shapes one is the local people are campaigning and people uh, like us are amplifying their voices we are uh, the, we are telling the nbwl um, the state has proposed to the nbwl to shrink sanctuary and which would allow many more industries to come and completely disturb and pollute the hydrology of this place uh, we have been uh, running huge campaigns to withdraw this um, proposal to denotify bed and that but the other kind of campaign which is happening and it has been very moving and powerful has been shared across the country in a sense is that vedandangal being a place where children come to a lot schools across chennai and tamil nadu are making art for vedandangal children making art for vedandangal you know right now is a time when we cannot go out in the streets and protest we are kind of covid closed you know our streets are sealed away our main uh, canvas for campaigns so children of uh, you know creating hundreds of pieces of art uh, and i just want to show you a few um you know this kind of evokes the 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 lady in the traditional dress the, the bird human being relationship and you know the perception of children is is very interesting you allow them the space to be uh, participatory um this is local people protesting along with the birds very interestingly you know they seem to have kind of teamed up to an extent that is true you know this is the words help formed with pelican feathers so this is a kind of a doomsday prediction on part of a seventh standard child so if you allow these industries to function here and by 2030 this is what the place will be so i want to end with uh, how we can uh, you know different things we could do to um, protect wetlands in our, in our within our cities uh, you know some generic ways in which we could do that and uh, uh, if if perhaps some of you uh, have been involved in this or know of other ways please uh, you could raise it as well one thing is about uh, citizen science now what what citizen science means is that there are various portals which are um, databases for biodiversity so people common people like you and me we can go to a place see the birds there the biodiversity there the flora and fauna there and then submit our observations and then there are experts and scientists sitting behind these portals reviewing it accepting it and and creating a database and this has been a very powerful thing which is emerging you know something as common as casually going out bird watching in a lake near you amounts in the protection of that lake and uh, let me give you a few examples for instance uh, the the mumbai coastal road issue right uh, which is going on right now um a group called the marine life of mumbai run by experts and enthusiasts the observations they made of coastal life on that stretch of mumbai and uh, what they submitted in the i naturalist portal was accepted and used in the mumbai high court when the coastal road corporation said there's nothing there there nothing lives there that's a barren land yeah so there's only one kind of barren land that's that's not desert grassland scrubland wetland that that barren land is made of concrete yeah? so uh, they accepted it and that was a very uh, you know that that kind of democratized science and and how science is used and a lot of other uh, refuting we have been doing for vedandangal for the adayar estuary for various other ca uh, campaigns we have been conducting here eias environmental impact assessments have been done badly so that the industry can be pushed on you know and we are refuting that with citizen science data so in vedandangal they've said 26 species of birds are found the sun pharma who who did a environmental impact assessment and we are using our citizen science data on ebird saying they are close to 200 species found so why 
in the 26 uh, species list, there are no migratory species. There are no species which have extra protection under law. So then that gets you into trouble. So then citizen science becomes very uh, important in those battles. Now, India has much more scope to bring in citizen science in, in the way some other countries are kind of uh, doing. Um, for instance, one extraordinary example is uh, the Fraser River Delta, which was a Ramsar site. A Ramsar site is a, a wetland with extra legal protection because of the biodiversity poles. Because you know people and, and students going there and observing that large numbers of migratory species are also using uh, areas outside the delta and they are putting it and they were putting up their observations. In 2012, the area of the protected area, protected space was increased 40 fold by, by uh, Canada and British Columbia where, where the delta spreads. Um, a few other examples would be in, in Florida um, in, in 2015, uh, because of the, the observations of uh, nesting uh, habitats of rails, creeks, et cetera, within urban parks in Florida, a uh, law was passed against the flying of drones there because it's uh, disturbing uh, wildlife and so on. There are a lot of others. For instance, in Chile, uh, the, 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 the IUCN used the eBird data to prepare the red list category of birds, you know, what is threatened, near threatened, and so on. And Knowing our laws, you know, what, what laws protect our wetlands or any kind of wilderness space? What rights do we have? What, how can we participate in the governance? For instance, if you take the wetland conservation rules, there are seven criteria to declare a wetland as protected. You know, do we know them? If we know them, then we can campaign for a wetland which is not being protected or which, for which is being protected, but the measures are not being taken. Similarly, the Water Act, uh, if, if we know what is in it, for instance, uh, the section 17.1 of the Water Act demands that every state has a comprehensive plan. I'm talking about India. Yeah? Comprehensive plan to mitigate and prevent pollution of water and all its water bodies. Now, does that plan exist? Or if it exists, is it being implemented? Now, we can use that. There's a fantastic paper by, by a lawyer called uh, Sahina Laskar. And... She has done case studies across India of how uh, you know, local bodies and, and NGOs and other individuals increasing the awareness of laws has helped fight uh, defaulting of um, authorities and, and, and corruption. Um, for instance, in, in Rajasthan, the Mazdoor uh, um, Sankriti Sangan, I, I think I'm, I'm not getting the word right, uh, which was started by Aruna Roy. She ha had a big way of creating an awareness about the rights of people uh, and how to use the RTI. And that kind of eradicated corruption within the local governing bodies. Uh, similarly, in Sundar Nagari in Delhi and in another place um, in Assam, um, I, maybe I'll, I'll uh, look up an NGO or created awareness of laws and how to file an RTI and the corruption within the public uh, distribution system uh, where they, they kind of uh, have, you know did not give people the food which well, they were supposed to give them. By filing RTIs, they eradicated the corruption. So knowing our laws is quite important, uh, is perhaps the greatest anxiety and fear of uh, a defaulting or a violating or corrupt authority. So that's, that's uh, one thing to consider. And... Um, Another thing is uh, dealing with education. Me being a, um, a nature educator, I am deeply, um, what do you call, uh, interested in the way I can you, uh, you know, engage with education to, to create these kinds of uh, learning spaces for children to become uh, autonomous and participative. For instance, one thing which is not there in our mainstream education is place-based education because the education system is top-down. A curriculum and syllabus is created by one authority sitting in Delhi, and everybody has to follow it. So, so I live in Chennai, uh, and the water bodies I depend on, I discovered after I got into my late teens, you know, the Chembarambakam Yeri or the, the Pulal Yeri or the Adeyar River. These are the water bodies which really affect me. But I learned about Ganga and Yamuna, which was, you know, in Delhi in great detail, and the geographies of, of that place. Similarly, if people are there in Mumbai, 
does your textbook and curricula talk about RA forest? Does it talk about Povai Lake? So the importance of place-based education, of it being uh, contextualized in the immediate locality, empowers one to stand for it, uh, participate in its protection and management. The other thing is citizenship education. That is something perhaps categorically is left out of our education system, which means that do we teach children how to participate in uh, social issues, environmental issues, good governance, uh, how, how they can make their voice heard. For instance, the Vedandangala art campaign was a children's participation in good governance. They're telling uh, the authorities saying, we have an emotional connect with this place because of what it means for us in our lives. Don't do this. Um, do we create spaces for that? For instance, children uh, can be taught to write PILs. It's simpler than some of these you know, essays we try, you know, teach them in high school. How to file RTIs? What are, the, what are our fundamental rights? Um, what are the laws I can use to back the, the issues which are close to my heart? And, and so on. So these are some ways in which we can engage with, with these issues. So I, I want to stop them and uh, perhaps uh, open it out for questions and other interactions. So yeah, thank you. Ivan, there's one question from the audience. Could you talk about environmental education in higher classes except in the science stream? Okay. So, you know, let's, let's not look at environmental education as a kind of subsidiary of education. Let's look at the way these local communities saw what was central to their ecology of self-reliance, of living and livelihoods. It was ecologically grounded. And I think the education system needs that. What the present education system is, is a factory model. The authorities need certain jobs to be, uh, you know, filled in so that the current paradigm of development can continue its uh, course. And education systems are not child-centric. They are not inclusive of various styles of learning, um, various ways of learning. It's not polyvocal, since that various voices don't speak and converse at the same time. It, it, it follows the indoctrination model. There's one voice speaking. Uh, that's how a factory works. There's an assembly line. And then you make products. And then if some product is not good, then you chuck it. Yeah, that's one thing. The other thing is it needs to be earth-centric, especially at the time of climate change. Uh, you know, what are the values of education? Some of the present values of education does not have in its system uh, social equity or uh, values of conservation, values of ecological protection which is not a separate thing, you know, it needs to be this, this solid pillar of education and from there, all other subjects draw from and center their discourses on. For instance, we, let, let's look at the way history books are designed. It's the entire discourse kind of uh, romanticizes power. It's about wars, it's about people in power. Perhaps an equal, if not stronger force which shaped our history was people's movements. I am having my water bodies or, or drinking water now because of the lakes the local people built and that I don't hear about. Um, you know, so we need to kind of radically reimagine the way uh, our values of education and how the way we design and present uh, curriculum. So just a couple of examples. Uh, I hope that addressed the question. Another question. Do you think the youth has a responsibility to educate the generation that came before us or should we stick to us and the generations that come after us? I think our only hope lies in youth. You know, <laughs> right. of course, there are a lot of people, for instance, yesterday Ashish Kothari spoke. Uh, right. You know, a lot of, you know, activists, young activists, I mean, including me, you know, look up to him and the work he has done and the legacy he has left behind for in his, you know, close to 40 years of work. There are people, but other, uh, other, you know, um, kind of set and static systems which are toxic uh, and which are unsustainable and uh, depriving future generations of 
uh, of a good life exist in the older uh, you know age groups and the systems they've formed so i think the youth has to be very vocal and there needs to be a uprising a groundswell of uh, campaigning as well as a push to reimagine all these things be it education be it the way uh, governance happens um, and so on so i think i think a huge uh, uh, percentage of this responsibility and, and hope lies with uh, the generation now and and education is a very strong way of doing that because some of the ways uh, for instance if i think about my own of anybody else uh, here a lot of uh, you know, climate change activists here think about when they were moved by a cause for environmental issues when they were touched by an issue when they were very young and then when you don't have that kind of sensitization and then you dull the brain into moving into this little groove of of job and life and in whatever those little trenches are uh, you know you you lose a grassroots way of addressing and engaging with these issues another question is has the ethno ecology of vedanthangal been documented scientifically is it recognized widely is there one like book or one journal we could turn to for being more educated about it yeah so the maps i took uh, from are from the national wetland action plan uh, of uh, 2013 to 2018 um it it completely documents the the entire this whole relationship and then there are also a lot of other kinds of literature you can vedandangal is something which is famous uh, in, in because of what it stands for and um, yeah so so that is that and the wetland action plan especially if you know of water bodies which have an a wetland action plan it's a very good document done by kind of premier uh, nature organizations and often the action plans are not uh, implemented Hmm. Uh, for instance one of the things uh, the action the wetland action plan for vedandangal uh, highlights again and again is about the drainage and water catchment area not just the water bodies which are important for the place and how the local uh, society's empowerment is important for its conservation but the the pollution control board and the state government has been systematically weakening the local communities there so that you create these void industry scams yes. Yeah. yes yes so i'd be happy to share some of those resources in in some form perhaps here or somewhere else oh, yeah. that would be lovely uh, another question is do you have an example of a country which has worked holistically included uh, citizen action and ecology and education which can work as a model for india see the only way some of these things happen um these ecologically rooted uh, cultural systems work as they work in small systems mm-hmm. we have hundreds of examples within india a country is too large a place it's again top down to right. kind of have a policy and then kind of drive it down everybody's throats everywhere regardless of whether they what context they are in right okay. uh, and and the kinds of cognition uh, in different kinds of people and their practices and cultures and so on but in other countries various examples occur in within india there are hundreds of smaller examples and i think they only come in small sizes uh, these examples yeah also uh, did the floods in mumbai uh, chennai sorry the floods in mm-hmm. chennai were the more intense what is a place there from our viewers Can you repeat that question. Sorry. Uh, uh, the floods in more intense but decrease in the water bodies around Chennai. Okay. Could could you, for instance, uh, maybe type that down? I'm I'm losing you. Ah, uh, floods in Chennai more hmm. intense due to the hmm. loss of water bodies in Chennai. exactly it was uh, for instance carer trust they did a um, a very comprehensive study of the cause of the floods of course the rains were a lot but a lot of these places for instance chennai if you look at the pallikarne wetlands if you look at other kinds of places 
there are banks there are colleges there are roads where lakes occurred now lakes were not built there to kind of do a kind of you know uh, you know good thing a nice thing to the land lakes are, lakes were built because that's the only way you can live there now if you build on the lake then you are under the water so it was termed an urban planning disaster because the water had nowhere to seep in or nowhere to grow i mean to kind of flow into the sea so river channels other streams were blocked the buckingham canal was blocked because of the sheer amount of ga- garbage there various lakes were encroached into and built upon and open soil was concretized so the water just had to stay there it it did not have any other choice and that was literally the flood scenario so are there any stories or books or websites which we can use for environmental literacy which are directed towards children okay. so the first um thing i would suggest is the publications a kalpa vriksh publications and their story books they are they are from various contexts within india and they look at specific conservation stories so for instance there is a story about sheru the hedgehog and it's about the grasslands of gujarat and then one day uh, a jcb comes to kind of turn the grassland into an inter- industry and then all the uh, what do you call the ind- the animals come together and then they protest and then they join hands with the local people and so on so kalpa vriksh publications has a beautiful collection of stories which are rooted in conservation values and are contextualized place based and and they are also in various other languages i would also recommend the uh, the works of the people's linguistic survey of india and if there are people here who have word lists of uh, words for ecology water bodies land trees soil and you know we could have a a barter of local language if if you know we could exchange these words you know there's this uh, saying in hindi which i hope i pronounce right it says uh, let me get that right uh just to evoke the fact that language flows just like water you know right. it says kos kos badle pani char kos badle vani so it says every mile water right. changes direction every four miles language Two changes right. pardon me for the pronunciation no 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 it was pretty accurate okay uh are there any examples of traditional practices of agriculture around vedan thangal which have preserved the ecology of the area um it's largely a paddy based area and paddy they are able to grow there because of the quality water. and quantum of water there mm-hmm. but if you look at other kinds of agricultural practices people grow millets a lot of people do mixed farming and so on but one serious threat to or not a serious threat, perhaps subsidiary threat is that the pesticide uh, you know usage uh, which is kind of creeping in because of the uh, you know the lack of empowerment uh, or self self uh, what do you call it? the enabling of self reliance within the community which the government could have easily done so they have to rely on uh, you know external sources one of them being Uh, you know pushed into using pesticide and fertilizers as part of the you know uh, kisan you know what are the, the pm uh, um, agricultural plan you know it has a lot it is strongly chemical farming oriented yeah okay uh, another question is how will the socio politics of the commons pan out for water bodies and areas which are around heterogeneous or hierarchical communities that's a very interesting question one example was that is the chavdar tale and what happened around mm-hmm. it and uh, i think uh, heterogeneous uh, communities is is one thing but where there is hierarchy and hegemony right. sometimes mm-hmm. what happens is that some water bodies are for the upper caste some water bodies right. are for the lower caste and uh, that that dynamic still exists in a lot of villages but is also changing in various places um uh, i i will have to uh, i i'll stay with that question and maybe uh, you know explore that a bit more um yeah um, yeah 
Thank you so much. I think those were all our questions. If anyone has any more, could you put them out in the chat box on Zoom or on YouTube? We will give you a minute or so. Another question that has come in has after such a disaster with the floods, has something changed? Is there you hope? Know, what the floods did were one thing they did, they washed out all these dirty rivers. The rivers are flowing clean, you know. And then after that, there were various things, you know. The Madras High Court uh, uh, slapped the government, saying it's because of you these floods happen. Remove right. the encroachments from the lake. Right. No, that's right. water's place. And a lot of that happened. And a lot of encroachments were removed. But the, the sad thing, the unfortunate thing is that the... The forces causing these disasters are often the ones affected the last because they're up in their iron towers. And, of course. You know, um, but um, one thing was that some, um, in the removal of some encroachment, some of them were marginalized communities and, and, and slums and so on, who, who, which were removed. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a mixed thing for the action which uh, succeeded the floods. Um, some of it good, some of it uh, not so good and questionable. But I think as, as people, we need to have greater uh, long-term memories and we should leave our short-term memories. We should remember the floods. We should remember the Bhopal gas tragedy. The government came up with something called the Environmental Protection Act right. in 1986. Only after tragedy killed 8,000 yes. people. Yeah. It, it, that very law came only after that. Leave alone the EIA so on. Um, so we should have, especially with related to environmental policy and, and, and governance, our long-term memories should work very well, um, rather than we kind of going back into the, you know, into our own cubby holes of, of life. Right. Right. So thank you so much. That was Yuvan who took out a lot of time from his incredibly busy schedule to be here. And he shared some really good artwork, which I recommend all of you check out. I really hope we can inculcate the concept of Jal, Jal Jungle Zameen in our daily lives and emulate every indigenous community which has been doing so much for our environment and has been unheard for so long. This was the first installment of People for the Planet campaign. We talked about Vedan Thangal and how it's been denotified now and how we stand against it. Thank you so much all of you for tuning in. You can contact us on social media. We are on Instagram at the rate Fridays for Future India. On Facebook, it is Fridays, the number four, future.india. And on Twitter, it is FFF India. If you have any questions, please reach out. If you have any suggestions, please reach out. Someone will contact you and someone will get in touch. Thank you so much.